what is the actual situation in the United States, where over 20 million colored people virtually live as a colonized nation under racist and economic oppression? Well, for the past 10 years, the struggle in America has been confined to what has been projected to the public as a civil rights struggle. And uh, in that context, it has remained a domestic problem. It has remained within the jurisdiction of the United States. And it has, and as such, it has been impossible for the Afro-Americans or American Negroes to try and enlist the support of other dark-skinned uh, people who are being oppressed the world over in, in that struggle. And the difference now uh, in the direction that the uh, struggle is taking from that, from the direction that the struggle has been going in in the past, there are many uh, of our people who are thinking more deeply and more broadly and are beginning to see the importance of lifting it uh, out of the national context or out of the domestic context or beyond the jurisdiction of the United States government. And the only way this can be done is by internationalizing the problem and, and putting it uh, at a level where it can be taken into the United Nations. The myth of time. Uh, there are those individuals who argue that only time can solve the problem of racial injustice in the United States. Got to wait on time. And I know they've said to us so often in the States and to our allies in the white community, just be nice and be patient and continue to pray and in 100 to 200 years the problem will work itself out. Uh, we've heard and we've lived with the myth of time. The only answer that I can give to that myth is that time is neutral. It can be used either constructively or destructively. I must honestly say to you that I'm convinced that the forces of ill will have often used time much more effectively than the forces of goodwill. And we may have to repent in this generation not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around saying, wait on time. <laughs> and so we must help time, and we must realize that the time is always right to do right. But in the final analysis, racial discrimination must be uprooted from American society and from every society. Because it is morally wrong. You call me 50. Okay, it looks like we're ready to go. Hey, Nolan, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to download all this and kind of edit it and mix in some other stuff. And if you have any ideas, let me know if you want a picture or something. You're looking good, man. I've been researching. Yeah, I've been uh, researching everything uh, you're doing, and it's absolutely outstanding. I'm so glad you're going to be at the United Nations. That is a huge thrill. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, so um, you're uh, you're coming out in February. Yeah, February seventeenth through nineteenth. Um, the reason for it being a multi-day protest is because, as you said, it's the United Nations. This is uh, I'm I'm not going to call it historic because I don't want to you know raise my hands up and tout the protest like we're pipping it out or anything, but. Uh, it's not. It's not going to be small. I'll just say that much. Uh, this is a big endeavor. It's taken a lot of time. It's going to take more time after I get done with this. Uh, and, and thank you for having me. Uh, I, I, I got more work to do uh, on it. Uh, and I'm. I'm, I'm kind of. I, I'm happy to. Have, I, I don't. I don't know if happy is a word because I wish we weren't in these circumstances. But I'm. Uh, I guess humbled. By it because uh, one big reason why I, I came up with the idea was because of what Malcolm X was going to do before he was assassinated. He was going to come to the United Nations and try to get uh, charges against America for what they always done to uh, black folks. So, uh, and Malcolm, since I was a teenager, has been a huge hero of mine. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's going to be big. It's going to be exciting. Uh, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. that. All virtually 99% of my energy is going into uh, putting this together. Well, that's amazing. You take all your personal time to get that done. And uh, has Black Lives Matter um, ever done any protests to the United Nations? Not that I know of. Um, I've heard there's been a couple 
for uh, native people for, in terms of uh, treaty violations and things of that matter. Uh, part of the problem there, obviously, every treaty that the native signed with this country has been broken. Um, and uh, so that's another reason why we're having this protest next month is because native people are completely erased and people want to think they're wiped off the map. So, you know, there's a, there's definitely multiple reasons why we're doing it. Um, and I, I, I don't think one reason is bigger than the other, uh, but it, there, are, there are a lot of important reasons. Well, genocide's a global epidemic. People at the UN should understand that it's ongoing all over the world. A lot of it perpetrated by uh, the U.S. and its allies through this military empire we have. I recently lived in the uh, state of Hawaii, and the Native Hawaiians, much like uh, Native Americans uh, here on the mainland and in Alaska and everywhere, have all been subjected to similar treatment. Um, um, how, how are things going with the uh, uh, Native Americans? Well, uh, I've been very blessed to just be taught so much information and um, also aside from the his historical value of what I've been told and the, the current reality, just incredible life lessons and how, I mean, their, their humility uh, and will is it's I can't even describe it on a human level it's superhuman um, but in terms of this country and the um, the 50 states and more so uh, the ones that I've that I'm bordering you know California all, all of the, the, the lower 48 uh, it's just it's everything I read every day I, I try to learn as much as possible there's so much to learn even if you heck if you were a uh, you know, professor, historian, expert on this stuff, the uh, the genocidal rabbit hole uh, for Native people is, it, it's almost bottomless. It's, it's so horrible. Um, and you, you just think about, you know, all the, stati the stats, you know, you look at one in three Native women are raped in their lifetime. I've heard anywhere to 34 to 37 uh, percent and 85 or over of the rapists are non-native men so they're targeted and I just uh, recently read an article that said uh, that 17 percent of native women are stalked or will be stalked in their lifetime only about eight percent of white women so that's you know double which is just shows you the lack of safety uh, they have uh, in this country and um, you know one thing that's really I mean, this this whole thing's been bugging me for a while. The more I learn about Native people, because you almost and, and just talk to, and I implore anybody watching, if you know a Native person, uh, call them up immediately. Uh, if you don't, go on Twitter. Try to you know just learn as much as inf information as you can, and try to talk to as many as you can, because they're the ones going through this, and you want to go to the source, obviously. Um, but it's just amazing how erased they are. Um, you know, the movies that come out, like Poca Pocahontas is probably the most famous movie about Native people, especially if you're, if you're a kid. And I grew up loving that movie as a kid. Uh, at my household, we probably watched it like 100 times. You know, kids, we watch movies. Uh, but as I've gotten older, I'm like, wait a minute, none of that, ha none of that happened. None of that happened. She was nine years old. She was raped. She was kidnapped. She died because of all these evil things. At a, it was like twenty years old. So, like, what what are you doing telling the story? If you're going to tell the story, you know, make it an R-rated feature because obviously there's gruesome, gruesome stuff in it, and tell it like it should be told. Uh, and as a black person, I've seen move nothing that bad because we we do have a voice you know we have BET we have Michael Jordan we have LeBron James we have Oprah you know we there are people in the black community that could pick up a microphone and people will listen the native native people do not have that um, but in terms of just the exploitation and dehumanization in the film industry and TV and entertainment um, it makes me crazy anytime I see you know like the whole Oscar so white thing it's like 
why can't you just give us the same chance you give other people? You know, uh, Joseph Fiennes, I believe his name, is going to play Michael Jackson in a TV movie. He's whiter than snow. Like, what, what in the world is going on? Um, but that's something Native people have to deal with every single day, everywhere they look, uh, whether they're watching football, baseball, whatever. You know, I mean, the Cleveland Indians, Washington's horrible nickname. Um, mm-hmm. So that, I mean, that's that, that's one huge part of the problem why there's a genocide going on in the most powerful nation on earth with the most media the most cameras and nobody knows about it uh is because people a lot of people think they're either extinct or they think the reservations are some they're like narnia or something and but in reality there are concentration camps or internment camps uh whatever phrase you want to use um and the the thing about the, the the flint water crisis now that's a racial situation you know, there's obviously a lot of black people live in Flint, and they're being denied a human right of water. Okay, everybody should be upset about that. Send as much water as you can. I completely agree. My problem is the same exact thing is happening on most of the reservations, and there's hundreds and hundreds of them, and no one's saying a word. So I'm going, what? do these people, can you see these people, you know? Uh, so that's a major reason why this protest uh, is happening. Uh, and I keep trying to tell my people, my brothers and sisters in the black community, we need to team up with Native people. Because if we team up as two races uh, and, and fight white supremacy, fight this institutional racism that's been here or been on these two continents uh, since 1492, they can't stop us. Um, and there are more, well, I think there have always been white, real white allies. I'm not talking about uh, Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or whatever, you know, like, wait, you see, like, Elizabeth Warren, if, if people don't know this, speaking of a race of natives, she's pretending to be a native person. She she identifies as native. She's not native. She is not. They, they fact check her. She's not. And she hasn't apologized. She hasn't said, oh, I, Thought I was, you know, nothing, you know. Uh, Bernie Sand. I mean, I was on Twitter last night, and Bernie Sanders, bar- his people barred black people from coming in to his event because they look like agitators. So apparently, we, my people, look like agitators to Bernie Sanders' his people. And this is not the first time this happened with Bernie Sanders. And not to go on a tangent, but uh, Palestinians, Hispanics, also have been barred from his events. So. Not talking about those type of like, oh, well, that they're not who we thought they were, you know, type of people. There are real white, white allies like yourself, Dan. Uh, so there are enough people, and especially if, if black and native people come together to really make a difference and change things. And something I've kind of put in my head, finish the job of what Martin Luther King and uh, Malcolm X were doing in the 60s. Because the movement stops in 68. And we've been treading water ever since. Uh, and I really, truly believe it can be done. And I really, truly, believe, truly believe this protest can do. It could put a big dent in institutional racism in this country. What do you think mainstream corporate media is doing for the movement? Are they covering it fairly? Not even close. I. Um, it's interesting. Um, when I started getting involved with this stuff, I started to notice that. No one, it, it, it was like they want to pretend it's not happening. And the thing that, one thing that people don't realize if you're not, you know, native or black or even Hispanic, Muslim, sadly now, nowadays, uh, that this type of stuff's been going on for a long time. It's just there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook, there was no cameras in the phones, you know. Uh, people have been, ki- been getting killed by cops uh uh, racially racially profiled for hundreds of years. That's not anything new. Um, but uh, I called uh, MSNBC, CNN. I wrote letters um, to everybody but Fox because, like, what, what's the point? Um, and I got one reply back, which is like, okay, well. Uh, and all I was saying was you got Native people getting killed by cops more than any other race in the country. Then you got my people you know, behind him, and also a horribly high number. And you guys would rather talk about Donald Trump and the Kardashians than 
tragedies happening, you know, every day. And that, I mean, if you watch the news, it doesn't have to be local, or it could be local or national. They're not uh, allergic to talking about bad things. Uh, so, I mean, how, how much do we hear about the Malaysian, you know, plane disappearance? We heard that every day for months. So it's not like they're not going to talk about tragedy. It's just they're being, being very selective about what they talk about. Uh, and then to add on to it, you have people, black or white, like Don Lemon or uh, Wolf Blitzer, even a Rachel Maddow or Chris Hayes. And I've wa I used to really be fond of MSNBC because they would tell stories that other networks wouldn't. But then I started to realize that they, they really held back on what's going on in the black community. Um, they, the, the girl who just died in, in jail uh, a week and a half ago, Gianna McMillan, 16 years old, black girl, died, arrested under shady circumstances, dies in jail under shady circumstances, wasn't on the news, you know, not at all. Uh, only, you know, internet newspapers, that's it. So that, I mean, that stuff's been happening with uh, news for the longest time. Um, I think, and the, again, bringing up the protest, my father always taught me, this, he, anytime he would speak on civil rights, especially since he was a part of it back in the 60s, I, my ears would pick, you know, prick up and I'd just shut up and listen. But one thing that always stuck with me, he said, a turning point in the 60s was television because all these white people in their privileged lives, going, oh, America's so great, you're driving a Chevy and eating hot dogs with the kids. But then they turn on the TV and they see these colored people getting slammed with hoses and sick with dogs and cross burnings, uh, church burning bombings and the whole nine yards. And they go, oh my gosh, this is, I didn't realize that and we got to stop this. Um, and you hope in humanity that there are more good people than bad. And I think the 60s showed that to a degree because although we didn't get close to, you know, being on par in terms of equality with, you know, white people, we did get a lot done. You know, uh, that, that was a huge decade uh, for black people. And uh, that's what has to be done now in my mind. That, especially if you're talking about Native people. They're... Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, that did get attention as it should have, but you could name hundreds of other people killed by the police or hate crimes of black people they didn't cover, but native people, zero, nada. And I could tell you uh, tragedy after tragedy, I mean, just like the worst murders and deaths you'd ever heard about. And, you know, the LA Times not covering it, uh, you know, the MSNBC is not covering it. It's just, it's the only stuff that comes out, it's usually on internet. Uh, newspapers and their internet site, uh, sites, it'll be, you know, editorial pieces and an investigative report, and then they'll just forget about it. So, like, hopefully you remember the article, but they'll just leave it there. Like, the th this has been going on with Native people since Columbus got to the Caribbean. This has not stopped. It, the, the genocide has just evolved. And the, uh, the actual, and you probably know this, Dan, the actual listings for genocide, uh, America hits on four of the five. The only one they uh, have stopped doing to Native people is um, uh, stop. Uh, not, not they don't sterilize women anymore. Thankfully, okay. like oh great, you stop that one, but you're committing the other four: killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. The, uh, Native kids are actually sold to white families in South Dakota, uh, which is, mm -hmm. I, that's not, you have not heard that on your late local news. Uh, and then um, you have uh, actual physical destruct destruction in whole or in part deliberately inflicting on the group's conditions or life, you know, calculating uh, to, erasure or destruction of a race or group and if you've ever been to a native reservation there you go they were built to kill them off much like the ghettos were built to destroy my people and again another thing nobody knows uh adolf hitler the 
whenever you think of the most evil man in the world, he's the first guy. But fair or not, whatever we, you know, whatever weird game of who's the worst human being ever, you know, he's usually the guy who wins in those. Uh, but he actually marveled at what America did to natives and the genocide they were able to inflict on them. Uh, he built it, it helped him think of the Holocaust and create it. Uh, so that doesn't tell you how bad these people have been treated and still are because the reservations are still there. The Nav Navajo Nation, 70% unemployment rate, 40% of them don't have uh, clean water, uh, they don't have a tap uh, that works, no, no water coming out, and, and they don't have a toilet, 40% of them, 40%. And that's it's not uh, abnormality, uh, that's that happens on uh, not so much exactly 40, but uh, in terms of the lack of water, the lack of internet, the lack of good housing, that's on most reservations. Uh, so yeah, it's it's this is really about bringing bringing awareness to the mainstream media, uh, to this country and its citizens, uh, and to the world. Uh, you know, you, you could look at the when you talk about has has. Uh, the news fairly covered uh, racial injustice in this country. Just look at uh, the terrorist attacks in, in France. Obviously horrible, obviously should be covered, you know. But there was the bombing in Kenya last year, and, and the, the death toll was very similar. The, the, the level of horrific uh, nature was pretty similar and no one talked about it. you know I, I i saw this commercial probably three times uh, the i forget his name the lead guy um lester holt guy who replaced brian Williams. they have him in france talking to you know french people about the tragedy and how they they're reacclimating to daily life I'm like that brother wasn't in kenya i i know it he wasn't in kenya but that's just that's the whole thing we're, we're second class if you're light, lighter of skin, you're okay, which is, you know, but that's the way it is and that needs to change. Uh, and that's yeah. what I'm pulling, putting all my effort in to do. Well, that's great. You stepped up to do this. You know, we talked about briefly before this that, uh, you know, you're on the radar for law enforcement and surveillance. Everyone is these days. Everyone is, including law enforcement themselves or uh, military people. They're, they're all being surveilled, including us as well. So you got to step up and do it. Martin Luther King talked about um, just being silent and, and the problem with that. Uh, getting to the United Nations, I got to tell you something. The, the, it's run like a club. It's you know people think it's a kind of an international government, but really it isn't. It is a big club. They have no Freedom of Information Act. You can't even request documents. At least with our own government, the United States, with all its problems, at least we have a Freedom of Information Act. You know whether you have to wait four years for everything to be blocked out. I don't know how good it is, but at least we have something. Um, also, they don't have any open meetings uh, that requirements, so their meetings are all closed. The buildings closed. They don't want to let you in. They don't have to let you in. Are you planning to um, be able to go inside the United Nations? <laughs> no, there, there is no plan uh, to step inside. Um, we're trying to basically just cause a little chaos but nothing dangerous well people can host you you know what on that situation you can take an eighteen dollar tour it's absolutely ridiculous it's like disneyland you stand outside the u.n in the morning you pay eighteen dollars you go through like airport screening and they kind of guide you through there are no meetings or anything it's kind of a joke and you know you think if you're a single mother with two kids you're going to pay eighteen dollars times three there are a lot of uh you know people here right here in new york city who live here you know in the area they can't even go to the UN it's very expensive to just go visit it's a you know a private club but you can be invited into panels and stuff through uh, host countries and non-governmental organizations and stuff I expect you guys will will hopefully get something but let me tell you something I actually was barred from the United Nations I was going to meetings there for about a month and a half and I kept asking about when the public was blocked uh, and the, after the first bombing of the World Trade Center they um, just stopped 
temporarily allowing the public into meetings. You used to get to go in and watch meetings in, in an area. They just stopped it for security reasons, but then they never opened it up again. And so the public has not been there for 20 years. There's no oversight. The media is like gladfly media. You talk about the worst of the worst corporate media and a cozy, um, just happy to have access, cocktail party mentality. That's what's going on over there. So. Um, we do have a couple of good bloggers over there, but uh, one particularly, Matthew Russell Lee. Also outside the UN, I think where you're planning to protest, they've gotten some special laws here in New York. Um, all the sidewalks are the city of New York. Uh, this, that NYPD acts as the de facto police force for the United Nations. The United Nations has security guards, but they don't have a jail or anything. It's their own deal over there. So really, the NYPD is the, the military, is the police force uh, for the UN, so they handle everything. But they got some special zones on those sidewalks out there where you cannot protest. They put up all these silver things. you got to get permits. They've really limited the area where people can protest to very, very small areas. and. Um, and, I don't th and it, it was upheld in a court of law, a, a low, lower level, I think, about where you can protest and can't protest, but no one's ever really challenged it. I talked to a, a good blogger friend of mine over at the United Nations, Russ, uh, Matthew Russell Lee, and he feels it ought to be challenged. I do, too. You know, you often have to go, when you go into a court case, it has to be appealed, and then it works its way up. But it's the sort of thing that they've curtailed the ability for people to even protest over there. So it's really a private club, and it's... Uh, it's something else. Here in the U.S., it's the stomping grounds, the Yale Club, the Harvard Club, the Princeton Club, and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the think tanks. And then we have our counterparts around the world who are, are, are all in that, too. But I am just absolutely applaud you for getting over to the United Nations and, and, and making, making the case. So um, uh, have you gotten permits and all that, or what are you going to do on that? Yeah, we're to your point. Uh, yeah, we're um, take care and take care of the permits. Um, I actually talked to a couple friends of mine because, uh, being a young man, I would like some uh, wisdom in this area. And uh, just I was just told do everything in advance. Uh, permits, uh, food truck. You know, just everybody is safe. Porta potties. You know, that whole thing. So that stuff will be taken care of. Uh, we're working with some really good organizations that will help us uh, cover donations. Uh, also with, you know, signs and stuff. Uh, so no one's paying out of pocket or anything like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, the UN, Minnesota, the LA Freeway, uh, you name it, you know, it's, it's not supposed to be easy or... Uh, a day in the park, these protests, uh, we're challenging the status quo, and the status quo says we don't matter. The status quo says our bodies can be used for target practice. Uh, that we're fighting for our right to live. That's what we're doing. Uh, and I, I said it the other day, um, you know, it, it to me, it's in my mind, it's it's uh, to parody uh, Fifty Cent's uh, first commercial album, uh, as as weak of a, a analogy or uh, paraphrasing as this is, get free or die trying. That's you know, I'm not one of those people, even though I understand the militaristic approach, because when you're pushed to the brink and all uh, nonviolent way of thinking and action hasn't worked. I get that. I don't so much condone it or believe in it myself. Uh, I take the nonviolent route. Uh, I think now the key is we have to push hard. We can't just keep going, uh, meeting in places and protesting and, you know, going home and turning on the TV. There needs to be uh, objective, and if we didn't meet it, try again. If we meet it, go the next step, go the next step, because we got a lot of no d doors to knock down. Uh, you know, you name it: uh, police, uh, prisons, uh, education. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I, I'm aware of the um, problematic uh, scare tactics. But again, that's 
protesting while colored in America. It's, you know, it's just the way it is. Um, so, you know, we'll be ready. Uh, and um, I think if you if you are a, as the uh, young people say, as I, I guess I'm still young, uh, if you're woke and you're colored, uh, you kind of have to know you got to be ready in these types of situations, whether you plan for it or not. Uh, it's a sad reality that every time I drive a vehicle, I, in the back of my mind, I am terrified. And every time, I'm literally every time I hear a siren, I flinch. My my head just turns to wherever my ears thought the siren's coming from. Um, and I've been harassed um, constantly by the police. Thankfully, I live in on the West Coast, a little more liberal, a little more, you know, okay, colored people, you're a little more equal here. So no beatings, no shootings, thankfully. Uh, but I do realize that, I mean, that happens all the time. And it doesn't matter if it's a 12-year-old black kid in Cleveland named Shamir Rice. It, it doesn't matter if it's uh, a 16-year-old, you know, in uh, Louisville, but uh, Gianna McMillan, you know, just it, Paul Castaway, uh, that just name him. Uh, there's the, the amount of hashtags uh, that there are for our dead, especially the kids, it just drives me crazy. Um, and uh, I mean, it doesn't matter how old you are, it really doesn't. There's one thing, and anybody uh, watching, uh, it's called Missing or Murdered in Indigenous Women. And most of the offenses and cases are in Canada, but there are some in the United States. Basically, it's Native women who get abducted uh, and just they fall, they just disappear. And so often you just find their dead body on the side of the road and sometimes in horrific conditions. Um, and I went through each one. Uh, it was, I think it was CBC.com, one of the Canadian news outlets. And I had to stop a bunch of times. I just, my, I just got so sad. Uh, babies, like literally babies, new, you know, uh, toddlers, uh, uh, kids, teenagers, women, mothers, grandmothers. Just like, are you kidding me? Uh, but again, that's how Native lives and Black lives are valued um, in this continent, especially in this country. Uh, you know this. This, I mean, people either forget or they don't realize these two continents, North and South America, that was that was theirs. That was theirs. It was taken by force, um, and that's you know. Now we're here, and that's all she wrote. Uh, it's not their land anymore. And I, it's it's sad that I hear so many um, people say that oh, it's manifest destiny, you know, survival of the fittest. I mean, it's just, it, it, in my mind, do you have any compassion or, or for one, uh, reason, is, is there any reasoning in your mind? Like, did Hitler just, he he went into Poland and he conquered Poland. So it was, it's okay because he it's manifest destiny. You know, it doesn't make any sense. But we're so filled with propaganda in terms of, uh, you know, this place can do no wrong. And I think the problem and as you, you stated with the UN it's uh, when you're partners with somebody it's hard to call them out for their uh, mistakes and misdeeds and wrongdoings and that's the thing we have here and that's why this protest is taking place um, well the corporatocracy you know so much of this goes back to just greed and in the days of slavery when they were bringing people over it was for profit it was for greed and an abuse of people and that continues today in New York uh, I've been here almost six months now I came out for the specific purpose of following the UN because I knew there were problems I actually lived out in Southern California myself and in Hawaii I've lived all over the country but uh, I came out here to, to New York and let me tell you something Wall Street is the root of a lot of this stuff does your group have any plans to make pay a little visit down to the big brass bull down there at Wall Street and uh, have a little presence down there? Uh, maybe in the future. I do have uh, 
a lot of ideas because, like I said, there's a lot of stuff to get done. There's a lot of stuff to clean up. There's a lot of racism to clean up. Um, and, I mean, you, I think we forget this, especially like the Daniel Holskall trial was a perfect example. Um, colored women are just, especially colored women, but women in general are just like, there's no, same thing with racist races. Oh, sexism, there's no war on women. I, you look around. Just take a look around. They get paid less. That's all you need to know, and you could add on a bunch of other stuff. Um, but that's another thing I want to uh, try to tackle. Um, I want. I mean, look at the the way the big banks, Wall Street, um, and yeah, most of what I do is with race. Um, but at the same time, we are one human family, um, and this is a case of trying to work on, uh, speaking of, I don't want to divert the conversation, but there was a young girl in Kentucky who was just completely mistreated and violated, uh, and I'm trying to get some action uh, by the superintendent and the school board there. Uh, the principal thought her what she was wearing was too risque, so he made her kneel down in front of her parents with him there and I mean, it's, and she felt violated, and and her self esteem, like I can only imagine after that. And she had every right to feel, you know, upset after that. Uh, but this is the type of, these are the types of things that we just like we'll read about in the newspaper and go, well, that, oh well, you know. Uh, but there are things that we can do. We can stop. Uh, we can stop rape culture. We can stop racism. We can stop sexism. Homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia. I mean, we're talking we're talking about uh, you know, the, the UN, the United States, uh, and and international relations. The GOP spent forty some million dollars since nine eleven on Islamophobia, uh, Islamophobic propaganda. Yeah. Obviously, it's worked perfectly. Yeah. So you have to at least give them credit for the uh, the completion of the job. Obviously, very evil, but this is the type of stuff we have to deal with. Um, and as far as turning the conversation back uh, to the UN and this protest and racism, um, yeah, there's uh, definitely things I have planned for the future. Uh, and uh, one thing I, I can't stand anymore is the mascots of Native people. And I've been a, I used to work in sports media, and I've, I've loved sports my entire life, including football. And uh, you turn on an NFL game, you may see Washington play. And they have, to me, as a black person, that R word is as bad as the N word. Especially if you know where it came from. The, the, the R word was created when white people were scalping, mm. literally scalping yeah, Native people. Disgusting. Yeah. 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 So we have that as a mascot and a, you know, a Native person as the mascot. Like, what in the world? Um, and that... Uh, I've, I've learned. I've learned recently that native kids, their suicide rate is just off the charts. Um, they have left uh, in their suicide notes. One of the reasons why they were so, you know, upset and, and sad was the mascots, because it dehumanizes uh, the race. It embarrasses them, um, and I mean it. It, I, my dad, if I remember correctly, his high school was the Compton Tar Babies. Um, oh, yeah, amazing. Yeah. So wow. you know, if I if I if that was going on today, and I you know I'm I'm in L.A., so if I drive by, like, what? Yeah. I'm I would stop my car, get out, and you know go into school and yell. Um, but they have to deal with that all over the country all the time, mm -hmm. and defense of the names like so. Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, there's a lot to clean up. And uh, as far as this February 17th to 19th at the United Nations in New York, um, this really can go a long way just to, one, raise awareness and, two, force American citizens to make a decision, have to make a decision. Are you okay with genocide going on in your country? Are you okay with black people being stripped of their human rights and right to exist? Or do you feel, oh, wait, that is horrible. We need to stop this, put pressure on the people you, we, we need to put pressure on and move forward. Mm -hmm. 
which is what happened in the 60s. But like I said, we have to we have to finish the job because the movement has been stagnant for 50 years. Thankfully, with Black Lives Matter, uh, we've restarted again. But as, uh, as especially of late, we have to go. We have to go harder. We have to go stronger, uh, and we really have to realize what's at stake here because mm-hmm. we're losing our kids every day. Well, that's great. Well, I hope you call out the UN on a lot of this stuff too, because as America goes, the UN goes, and that's just the the sad reality. You know, on kind of a personal note, I have a question. There are always these people who say. Uh, I'm just doing my job. Maybe they work in security or they work in technology or whatever they do, and they're kind of, kind of, kind of cogs for the man, so to speak. And they just say, "Well, I'm just doing my job. I got to feed my family." You know, you're out here doing all this stuff, making it happen, putting up a resistance. I, I have somewhat little patience for people who say, "I'm just doing my job." What do you think about people who will inflict harm on others or? you know, even spy on you, a black, you know, your brothers, so to speak, spying on you, doing things for the government or, you know, whatever, uh, just doing their job for a paycheck to feed their family. Yeah, um, I might, especially you talk about cops, I've, uh, in the last year and a half since this stuff has blown up, um, my opinion of them hasn't got any higher it's gotten a lot lower, <laughs> gotten a lot lower. Um, but the problem with that those type of situations and I think Edward Snowden's a perfect example uh, when people work in that type of um, militaristic really I think anti-human type of situation so let's even talk about spying on other people and really just stripping them of their privacy uh, it it is a right or wrong situation, um, and we always. I mean, we're very selective with our history here in this country. Um, and when we talk about tragedy, we always go to the Holocaust. And today, being a, a Holocaust memorial all across the world, as it should be, uh, we always go. Well, we're the good. We're the good Germans. Were they just following orders? Well, yeah. okay, that's a fair question, but. How about here? You know, how about the the the, the complete uh, genocide of the of the natives that are still happening? How about the slavery? How about the new Jim Crow going on right now? Um, how about that? How, can we hold these people accountable? Accountable? Yes, we should. Uh, because if you don't, stuff like people like Donald Trump become president, and there are then you have ID badges, you know, on. A race of people, and I believe that happened before uh, in Germany. Uh, you know, to a race of people. Mm-hmm. So that's, the, I mean, that's that's the whole point. You you have to hold people accountable, and in terms of uh, jobs like that, to to me, I I wouldn't take a job like that. Yeah, and I get I get the the, the whitewashing in this country. Um, I used to support everything the United States did. Not that everything, but a lot of the things. Uh, and uh, I, I, like every every war through history, I wanted us to win it. I was like, well, we didn't win Vietnam, darn it. Like, really. um, but then I started to realize a lot of that stuff was unjust, even including the Vietnam War. There were so many war crimes committed in that war. Uh, and you talk about both uh, Iraq wars, Afghanistan. Um, and so we get, we get taught that this country can do no wrong, this system can do no wrong, but the, it was built on institutional racism, and it still exists. I mean, um, the capital of this nation is named after a slave owner who murdered women and children of native descent. That is the equivalent of having Germany's capital named Hitler. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't mince words there. That's just what it is. I have... We're living a lie. We're living a lie, and we do daily in so many, many, many ways just because it's convenient. You're absolutely right. And uh, we, it is convenient. It's much more convenient to play Candy Crush on your iPad, you know, go see Star Wars, both things I if you like doing that stuff, do that stuff. Yeah, you know, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, but just doing those things and kind of plugging out from the world and just 
not caring. I think there's a difference between, you know, if you have a, a, a tough job, if you're working, you know, a, a, a ridiculous amount of hours per week, okay, you know, that, that's your life. But it's another thing to completely not care. And to even me, it gets a little uh, redundant when we talk about white people and the white privilege and the white allies and the white silence. But it is what it is. Uh, the more white people that check out, the more it hurts us because the more that type, all that, all that racial injustice gets to be, you, you, look, you look away from it. And you can look at any tragedy throughout history, and we always look at the Holocaust, that's exactly what happened. Everybody, millions of Germans just looked the other way. You know, no, I mean, you know, we just beat Czechoslovakia, everything's fine. Hey, man, I love Germany, it's all good. And then, you know, it got worse and worse, and we know the story. But that's the type of thing we need to be more accountable of, of ourselves and our leaders. Um, I got... On Twitter, I get a lot of trolls and even uh, reasonable, reasonable people uh, coming at me. And I, I'm fine with conversation as long as it doesn't get crazy and we're rational about it. But last night, Bernie Sanders, his people barred black people from his event because they look too, you know, thuggish or, you know, too dangerous, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and there were some people saying one it never happened because oh where's the news report well geez you know um and two uh we need to support him because he's the arguably the best candidate well that that's the excuse he's the best candidate yeah. out of whatever we have and he's being racist to colored people but we have to support him. i mean it just doesn't at least in my mind it doesn't make any sense and that feeds into the institutional racism, the sexism, and all the evils. And, and you know, a, a really this world, because the United States is the most powerful country in, in the world. Um, and I hope that, to, I guess, paraphrase uh, uh, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King, uh, we get to a point where not race doesn't matter, because that will never happen because you would have to have amnesia for race to never matter. But we, we get to a point where diversity just means hiring the best person for the job. Oh, he's Pakistani? Okay. Oh, he's white? All right. So we don't need a Oscar so white hashtag, you know. Th that stuff isn't needed. Um, and I, that's what I'm pushing towards because I, I've actually gotten to the point where I'll watch a movie. Example, Trainwreck, Amy Schumer, Funny Lady, uh, and the cast, a lot of good actors, but I, halfway through it, it was 30 minutes through it, and I was, oh, this is a funny movie. I, I just, it hit me. There are no colored people in this movie. There's just white people in this movie. I'm like, we exist in the world. There are a lot of colored people in this country. In, in fact, in about 20 years, there'll be more of us than white people. And I just, I, I can't watch this anymore, so I just turned it off and did something else. Uh, and I, LeBron James was, did a cameo, so, oh, we got a basketball player. It's not ter stereotypical at all. Uh, but that's the type of stuff we have to stop, and that's the stuff we have to work toward to the end. So, there, I mean, I realize that there are, there is evil in the world, and there are evil people, um, and building a perfect utopia isn't feasible, but building a better country, a better world is very feasible, especially compared to what we have to work with right now. Uh, the fact is, I mean, you have a, the worst genocide in human history is still happening in the biggest country on earth and the most important, the, bit, the most powerful country on earth. That, 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 that does not compute. That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, black people are still, and Latinos, are kept from owning nice homes. Redlining still exists. Absolutely. Yeah. So these, I mean, this stuff, I mean, and again, you can look at the superficial stuff too. Oh yeah, we can't play certain roles even when the role is supposed to be a colored person. Supposed to be if it's historic. Michael Jackson? No. Cleopatra? No. I mean, like, what? Why? Uh, you know, we're not going to admit it, but we don't like you because you're 
color. Well, geez. Uh, I mean, there were, <laughs> and so Anthony Scalia, Scalia is a yeah. Supreme Court justice. He has openly said, white people are this smart, black people are this smart. And everyone's, oh, that's okay. It's a, no, he could be a, the, a judge on the most impo important, powerful court in the nation. But what? No, stop that. Get him out of there, you know. So that's just the stuff, that's the stuff we have to stop and get rid of. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I'll put in my two cents here about just honesty generally in society. It's certainly lacking in our society and la lacking within government. I mean, they just lie to you. James Clapper, we could go on and all day, President Obama, everybody just, they just flat out lie. Yeah. And it's, so getting to some form of honesty. And then and I'll just reiterate, the corporatocracy, the very wealthy shareholders, I have a finance background, a finance degree, I was an investment advisor, I gave all that up for this public service that I'm doing to try to get the world out to try to make a difference. So I do all of this for free on my own time, my own dime. But uh, really the root, the root of a lot of this evil is greed and corporatocracy and they are controlling uh, Wall Street and their wealthy shareholders are controlling the United States government and the United Nations, absolutely the United Nations. It's, it's more closed than our own government. And, and that's kind of the wave of the future, these, these, uh, these uh, super, super national organizations, World Trade Organization, UN, we've got to get on top of it because an individual, you have absolutely zero rights there. Yeah. You're supposed to go through your country. So I'm so glad you're calling them out and being there. Nolan, thank you so much today. You're doing a, a, an incredible job. I'm looking forward to seeing you here. I will be covering it all three days when you get here at the UN. And uh, thank you so much for your time today, and I uh, look forward to keeping in touch with you. Definitely, let's stay in touch, and uh, thanks for having me. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Nolan. Have a great evening. You too. Thank you.